Welcome to Friends in Fiction, five best-selling authors and the stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, Patty Callahan Henry, and Mary Alice Monroe are five longtime friends with more than 80 published books to their credit. In 2020, they created Friends in Fiction to provide author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing, and to highlight independent bookstores. These friends discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Hi, everyone. Happy St. Patrick's Day. But more importantly, happy Wednesday night, friends and fiction. I'm Mary Kay Andrews, and I'll be your host tonight. I'm Kristen Harmel. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey. I am Patty Callahan Henry. Uh And Mary (laughs) Mary (laughs) Alice is frozen and beautiful. Oh my like gosh, that. she froze in a glamour shot. How I she was that? Like, in like an author photo. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta freeze at least it's least it's least with your not with your mouth like this. See, I, how, I freeze like that. Would be that's how I always yeah. freeze. I, I I'm always so jealous. Freeze. Yeah. <laughs> no, oh, Patty, go on. Patty the other day said, I have a great idea. <laughs> it was like that's hilarious. Okay, well, like, well, while we wait for Mary Alice to thaw. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Um, you know, if I seem sleep deprived tonight, that's because I'm still suffering from a book hangover after spending the weekend binge reading Ariel Lahans and Jennifer Robson's latest historical fiction novels, which had me convinced I was living in World War II era France and Italy instead of sunny spring-like Atlanta. I I know all of us, we can't wait to discuss these powerful books with both authors. I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions too. So drop those in comments. And I promise we're going to try to get to as many of them as we can. At Friends in Fiction, we love when our partners partner. Just like y'all do out there, you partnered and built a book club. You've made friends with each other. Well, now our partners have partnered. So this is what has happened with Mama Geraldine's and Page One. We are so thrilled to let you know that the April subscription boxes from Page One will include, guess what? Delectable cheese straws from Mama Geraldine's. So subscribe now and get in on this chance to support both of our partners. And remember, you can order cookies and cheese straws on the Mama Geraldine's website with a 20% savings with the code Fab five. Once you try them, you'll be hooked just like we are and just like page one is. Mm-hmm. And speaking of page one, friends and fiction, it is time to mobilize the troops. You guys know that page one is our amazing partner. They have been nominated for the best book subscription box by USA Today and 10 best. And they are currently sitting at number 12, which we think is completely unacceptable. They are not page 12. They are page one. <laughs> and as a small female owned business, they are number one in our hearts. So let's get out and vote. We want to come together and help them hit number one by voting every day until March 29th. We're going to put the link where you can vote for them on our Facebook page. Um, but we love them and we want them to be number one. So thank you to Page One for partnering with Friends in Fiction. And remember, you guys can get 10% off of subscriptions with the code FAB5. All right, so I know we just had Patty's big launch for Surviving Savannah last week. Um, And if you weren't here for it, I'm telling you, you have to go back and watch that because I mean, there was Oscar worthy acting, I think. But just fast forward through my parts. (laughs) (laughs) No, you were fantastic. I mean, nothing, I, you know, I still have my my beard sitting right here though. So (gasps) that gives you any idea. So, Anyhow, but our Patty has another surprise up her sleeve. It's the cover reveal for her glorious novel, Once Upon a Wardrobe. I am so excited for this book, and I know that you are all going to be so excited too. Patty, can you let our viewers in on this secret project you've managed to pull off? Absolutely. But first, I want to say thank you for last week. 
Y'all were incredible. I think yeah. every event I did, half of it at least, was you was y'all, friends and fiction crew. And my Fab Five, it was an extraordinary week. But meanwhile, we <laughs> always want you to be the first in the know. So are you ready? Because here is the cover for the first time on the internet yeah. for my winter book out in October called Once Upon a Wardrobe. <laughs> Oh, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. I will be telling you so much more about it in the coming months, but this novel is very much a story about a story. The year is 1950, and the book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, has just come out, and a little brother is obsessed with it and asks his mathematical genius sister, who goes to school at Oxford, to track down the author, C.S. Lewis, and ask the only question that matters to him, where did Narnia come from? And that's all I'm gonna say for now because I can't wait to talk to our guests about their historical novels. Oh, goose! I know, it's so beautiful. <laughs> I cannot wait. Yes. So tonight, as we mentioned, we've got two best-selling authors whose books all five of us have loved and championed. Ariel Lahan is the author of four novels, including her latest, Codename Helene, now out in paperback. And my dear friend, Jennifer Robson, whose newest release, Our Darkest Night, is her sixth work of historic fiction. Sean, can you bring the ladies in, please? Mm -hmm. Hi. 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 I'm double waving. <laughs> Great to see you. So good to see you guys. Hello. Thanks for coming. Hello. And you got, we have to let you know that Ariel's, oh, so Ariel's got glitches. There she is. There she is. Yeah. So if, she, if it seems glitchy, that's because it is glitchy. <laughs> It wouldn't be with Wednesday, Wednesday night. night. Yeah. It yeah. is. I'm on my phone. Well, anyway, welcome, ladies. We don't care how you got here. We're just glad you did. And we're <laughs> so happy you could join us in the middle of Women's History Month. Yeah. Now, I happen to have some inside info that both of your books, which are set in World War II era France for Ariel and Italy for Jen, were inspired by true stories. And we want to hear more about that. So I thought it was genius timing that Patty's column last week for Parade Magazine was about having that light bulb moment yes. Yes. and doing something about it. And Mary Alice's Parade column this week is about making your own luck. Unfortunately, she couldn't make her own luck tonight because <laughs> yeah, she her internet gave out. So. <laughs> anyway, she's on a remote island, yeah. literally on a remote island. Um, but I think both of those elements about making your own luck and that light bulb moment are Maybe there's elements of those stories. And I'd love to hear you explore. Jen, I know, I remember you telling me that your husband. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you telling me that your husband, Claudia's <laughs> Italian family furnished the inspiration yeah. for our darkest <laughs> night. <laughs> but can you tell us about the moment you knew that the universe was nudging you to write it? You know what? It coincided with my my coming to the point where I'd been working on a, a totally different book that was not coming together. You, we all know that terrible feeling. You've, you've put some time into a book and it's just, it's not gelling. The characters aren't talking to you. And my son had come to me, you know, with this question, were the stories about um, my husband's grandparents in Italy, were they true? Was it true that uh, they had helped to shelter uh, fellow Italians, Jewish Italians during the war. And I couldn't tell him. I mean, I mean, I, I thought it was true, but I couldn't point to any real proof that I had. So I used that as an excuse to stop working on the other book. You know, I, I'm sure every writer uh, here and listening understands what that's like. Oh, oh, this this is so much more important than the work in progress. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and basically five minutes after digging into it, I knew I had something. Uh, it wouldn't actually focus on my husband's family for many reasons. It just felt too close. But also I couldn't I couldn't get all the details that I wanted. But if you make up the characters, uh, it's, it's you know, there's there's worlds to be created within the kind of the confines of, of the known history. And that right. was the aha moment when I thought, oh, I can tell this story, but from a different point of view. Uh, and yes. that's where the character Antonina, my heroine came from. So wow. Ariel, I seem to recall that you knew the story of Nancy Wake for some time before you actually tackled this book. 
What was that light bulb moment for you and the moment that you knew you had to make your own luck and go ahead? Yes, thank you. And I hope I hope my phone cooperates. I actually had never heard of Nancy Wake until 2015. I was sitting in a hotel room in Buffalo, New York, all by myself. I was on book tour for my second novel and I got an email from an old friend and she'd sent a link to an obituary for Nancy Wake who passed away in 2010. That's not a spoiler. Um, <laughs> and my friend was from Australia and she said, Ariel, I don't know if you've ever heard of Nancy Wake, but she's a legend down here. We love her. I think she'd make a great subject for a novel. And if you don't write about her next, we can no longer be friends. Um, <laughs> you can ask my real mother how good I am at doing as I'm told. So I, I actually did not write about her next, mostly because I was in the middle of a novel about Anastasia Romanoff. But as soon as oh, I no. finished my Anastasia novel, I went back to that email. I went back to that obituary. And as it did the first time I read it, all the little hairs stood up on the back of my neck. And I, I read this that. story I of this amazing, brassy, brazen woman who left her husband at home to hold down the home front and she went off to war. And I thought, this is yeah. it. This is my next story. That's great. You know, each of the five of yes. us completed new novels this past year. And, and we're all hard at work on upcoming projects. So I thought I would ask all of us to tell us briefly when and where was your light bulb moment in the process. And I will tell you that with The Newcomer, my book that comes out in May, I had a light bulb moment when I read a story in the New York Times about illegal Airbnbs in New York City mm -hmm. with millionaire landlords who were literally turning um, very high rent condo buildings into literal hotels because they were renting out all these units as Airbnb. And so when I, when I read that story, I knew I had, um, I knew I had a way into um, my protagonist meeting the man who ultimately changes her life and not in a good way. How about you, um, Christy? Um, you know, it was kind of a double light bulb for me. Uh, I at first had a friend that um, was telling me about how she had these frozen embryos left over from her last round of IVF. And um, she didn't know what she wanted to do with them. And it was something she'd never thought about. And she said, you have to write a book about this. And so it was one of those things that I kind of put in a file, but I just couldn't get the story. I had list after list of like, it could be this or it could be that, or I don't really know what the story right. is. Um, and so I was trying to figure out, it was after um, I just finished Peachtree Bluff series, I was finishing up Feels Like Falling, and I was like, what am I gonna write next? And I was actually gonna write something different um, than Under the Southern Sky. And I had a friend call me on the phone, and we had been discussing this, and she said, you know that embryo story you wanna write? And I was like, yeah. And she said, I just delivered my first baby, she was in her residency, um, and she said it was, for a man whose wife had died five years ago and he um, used a surrogate and just had a baby with the embryos they froze before she died. And I was like, okay, well, that's, I'm writing that story. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, sometimes the universe is like, nope, this is what you're writing next. Um, yeah. So there, it's not always that obvious, but actually I was putting on um, four leaf clovers are like kind of a big symbol in the book. And um, oh. I was putting on my four leaf clovers tonight and I was like, That's oh, awesome. it's perfect for St. Patrick's Day. Awesome. Yeah, yeah um, it's it's uh, it's cool to hear you saying that, uh, Christy, because I loved your book so much. And I know it comes out, gosh, in almost exactly a month, right? A month and yeah. three days. Yep. So <gasps> it's cool to hear the inspiration for that. And then um, Mary Kay, I just finished your book, I think two days ago. I emailed you and told you how much I loved it. So it was really cool to hear your light bulb moment too. It was so good. Uh, the newcomer's awesome. Um, so my light bulb moment, I kind of had two moments that pieced together the book of lost names. Um, one was um, not a light bulb. It was kind of a slow burn from my last two books. Um, I began to really wonder who these document forgers were. You know, I was talking about document forgers in both books about the French resistance, mm -hmm. but I had no idea how you got to be a document forger. Who did this kind of work? So that was this little question in the back of my mind. But I would say instead of a light bulb moment, I had a striking the match moment that lit that mm -hmm. long fuse. And the striking mm -hmm. the match moment was um, seeing an article in the New York Times, which my literary agent sent to me actually, about 
Nazi looted books and the search mm. to return them to their rightful owners. And I yeah. read that and mm. I thought that's the story to wrap around the story. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I needed. It was like the final piece of the puzzle mm -hmm. fell into place. Mm -hmm. So cool. It's such well, a good book. I'll tell you, I think tonight, the, you know, the, the on St. Patrick's Day, the leprechauns like to play tricks, and I think they're playing a lot of <laughs> tricks. I apologize <laughs> for disappearing so quickly. I'm back now, and I really, I love being with y'all. Happy St. Pat's. Well, my light bulb moment always comes from nature. Y'all know that. So for the summer of Lost and Found, I was sheltering in place up in the mountain house up in North Carolina, and... At that time, the pandemic was just beginning and I was paying attention to what was in my own backyard, you know, the exotic that you often neglect to pay attention to. And I knew all of us would be facing a lot of isolation coming up and hardships. But, oh, you know, there were great moments of listening to the cardinal sing and the, the identifying trees and taking long walks and even a bullfrog. So right now, one of the reasons why I probably went offline aside from leprechauns, is I am staying at a pristine island called St. Phillips in South Carolina. And it's a, nat a national natural landmark. It's an amazing place. And it used to be the home of Ted Turner. And now it's part of the South Carolina State Park System. So today I saw an eagle, a rookery of egrets, alligators galore, and a boneyard beach, which is really just felled trees dead on the beach. And I'll tell you, right now, the light bulb's going off like crazy. <laughs> That's great. Um, I know, and, and Ariel, when you said that about that tingle, we've talked about that a couple times this week, about that you feel it right here on the back of your neck right? Mm -hmm. Or down your arms. Did we lose Ariel? Oh, and I'm blood. talking here. Oh, I know. Those you, leprechauns. You, those, leprechauns. those leprechauns, but you feel a buzzy feeling and you've all heard the story by now. You don't need to hear it again. But for the, my light bulb moment for surviving Savannah was when I realized I was researching a ship that a shipwreck hunting company found that we were both researching the same ship at the same time. But for once upon a wardrobe that you just saw the cover to, it was when I realized that I was asking myself this question over and over. And the question was, where did Narnia come from? Where did Narnia come from? Where did Narnia come from? And I realized if I wanted to know that bad, then I was going to make my character go find out. Yep. So, but it was very much like a book. Well, if I wonder, somebody right. else will. But it's interesting to hear how each story has its own little seed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. they're true. And I want to remind everybody um, that if you haven't already, you want to make sure that you go to ParadeMagazine.com so you can read Mary Alice's beautiful essay this week about um, making yeah. your own luck. So now back to Ariel and Jennifer. You know, I binged your books back to back, Our Darkest Hour <laughs> and Codename Helen. They're so good. Weekend, and honestly, I found myself so immersed in your worlds in Italy and France during the war that I, I, I'm not kidding you when I tell you I see Nazis behind every tree. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was in the shower and I was feeling, I was feeling guilty for taking a hot shower. And oh my gosh. My husband and I went out to breakfast and I thought Nina and Nancy are back there in Europe choking down, you know, make-believe coffee and watered down turnip soup. <laughs> Polenta. <laughs> Lots of polenta. Polenta. Yeah, they got no pasta at all. Jen, what's up with that? No, they just, the, the wheat was so expensive. It was one of these things. My husband's family, they that's one of the things they kept saying to me. His elderly, like the Zia, his uh, Zia Lucia and some of the other aunts and uncles that talked to me, they said, we never ate bread. We didn't, we couldn't afford bread. It was just polenta, polenta, polenta. So wow. that was um, boring, right? Yeah, and it, it's yep. it's like it's you know what it is. It's grits, basically. Mm -hmm. I right. think like yeah. again, I'm from Toronto, but I feel as if grits <laughs> are basically the same thing as polenta. Yeah. Grit adjacent. Yeah. Grit adjacent. Yeah, grit adjacent. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, just plain grits with nothing, like no salt, no like nothing uh, <laughs> yeah. for breakfast every morning. Yeah, Jen, why don't you tell us a little bit about our darkest hour? So it's it's set it begins more or less in Italy in 1943 in Venice where a young woman called Antonina Mazin uh, she lives with her elderly father who is uh, a physician one of the few physicians still practicing 
uh, medicine in the Jewish quarter of Venice. And he has to do so covert covertly because Jews have been barred from all the professions. Uh, it's a really dire, dire time. Um, and her mother lives in a, in a rest home. She's had a stroke and is, is very infirm. And her father comes to the very reluctant conclusion that Antonina has to go into hiding. Uh, the Germans, uh, or rather the Nazis, are specifically are, are, have, have begun their occupation of Italy. And, uh, and he has found a, a sanctuary for her with an old friend of his who is a parish priest in a little village called Mezzocell in the, in the countryside, in the foothills of the mountains. And so Antonina very reluctantly goes, uh, and not to live with Father Bernardi, but with one of his parishioners, a young man called Niccolo Gerardi, uh, and his family. And she has to pretend to be his wife. That, that's the only way that she can survive, is to hide in plain sight as the Catholic wife of this, of this peasant farmer. And so not only is there the whole fish out of water element, she's a very cultured young woman learning how to become a, a physician herself, um, but she's never lived the life of, uh, you know, of, of, of anything close to, to what the Gerardi family endures on a day, day in day out basis of, which is hunger, um, grinding labor. Um, and, and so she, she has to learn how to how to how to make a new life for her there, but there's also this this net uh, slowly slowly closing in on her. Uh, the constant presence of Nazi uh, officers and soldiers, always vigilant, and also um, uh, just the the local fascists. And one Nazi official in particular begins to get very suspicious of her. Uh, he's an old grudge um, against Niccolo. And I'm not going to tell you any more than that, but things get dire. So, very dark. Very dire. Oh, speaking of really dark stuff, Ariel, um, wow. Because your protagonist literally parachutes into France in the middle of the night. And now tell us what happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh oh. We're oh. We're hoping she's going to unfreeze. Oh, the leprechauns again. <laughs> They're at it tonight, huh? <laughs> the computer leprechauns, computer leprechauns are real. Are real. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wait, is that the leprechauns typing that to us? Do you think? <sighs> are, are, are they inside? <laughs> They're coming from inside the house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mary, uh, Ariel, I wonder if you could, um, oh, you, we, you, we can't type the comments. She could type her answer and I could, and we could read it. What do you think guys? Yeah, yeah that can, can work. You, Ariel, Ariel can you hear us? Do that. Where, Ariel, wave if you can hear. Oh, she's on her phone. She can't type into oh, spot. I can hear you. Oh, oh, oh okay. Well, well, I just heard you. Ask a question for Jennifer and give her time to get back on. Yeah, uh, Ariel, can you, are you on froze? Mm -mm. No, okay, we're gonna go over to Jen again. And oh. we hope we can get back to Ariel. Are you there? She keeps waving in and out. Okay. <laughs> I guess it's the Jen show tonight. Um, I hate that. Okay, so I'm Jennifer. Here. I can hear you. <gasps> okay. So tell us about Codename Helene. See if we can hear you. We're yeah. dying to hear it. Go. <laughs> I think there's a delay. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm here. Go ahead, Mary Alice. I'm here. There you go. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I can I can tell a little bit about it. Maybe she'll come in in a moment. So, code name Helene is about this amazing uh, Australian woman, Nancy Wake. Um, she is in Paris um, when the Nazis really start to close in and. Um, She's married to a Frenchman and she decides to um, he, they are living in Marseille by then. And he, she decides to join, not only join the French resistance, she gets recruited to um, organize and mobilize um, the members of the resistance um, in the countryside. And, and she goes to England. She's working for the English. Um, and she goes to England and parachutes into, in the middle of the night, into the countryside in France. 
and it's only the second time she's ever parachuted. So it's an amazing, amazing story. And I hate that she um, is having problems, but we're going to go over to Jennifer. Um, uh, Mary Alice, you've got a question, right? Yeah, I do. And hopefully Yay. we'll see Ariel again in a minute. Uh, Jennifer, your previous novels, novels were set in England and France, yes. and they alternated between World War I and World War II. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, what sparked your fascination with that time period? And do you ever see yourself maybe moving into a novel set entirely in the contemporary time? Oh, good question. Uh, so, you know, in terms of what sparked my interest, I think it really began, I have to give full credit to my father, who's now retired, but taught history mm. uh, for, you know, from the late 1960s until his retirement almost 50 years later. And uh, he's now reluctantly, like, he did a, a kind of a, a like a, a semi-retirement just to see if he liked it and he didn't really like it. And then he kept yeah. teaching for a while and now he's fully, fully retired. Um, and so, it, you know, the the Great War, uh, uh, First World War, and the Second World War were were topics of conversation around the dinner table. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, you know, he he was a, 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 an incredibly talented teacher. He was the kind of uh, professor who, if you ended up getting him in first year, uh, your your freshman year of college, uh, you'd end up studying history. Uh, he just had that wow. kind of magnetic appeal. And, and because I think he was always motivated by uh, the stories of, again, the ordinary people who get caught up in extraordinary times. Yeah, and I yeah. think that's what sparked my interest uh, mm -hmm. in history. Now, in all fairness, though, when I started college, I did not plan on taking history or becoming an historian. I think I was having a little bit of teenage rebellion. <laughs> and again, I had this incredible professor in first year, this amazing man called Paul Webb. Uh, where I went, I was at King's University College at, at Western University in Ontario, and uh, and he again sparked the the this just fascination, and so I went on and did graduate work that focused on the Second World War. In and could Britain. you not hide your light under a bushel barrel, under a bushel, and tell us that you studied at Oxford, that you have a doctorate? <laughs> well, and that's how Patty and I can connect. Like I felt this yeah. connection with Patty initially because here's somebody I can talk to Oxford about who kind of, not that other people don't get it, but there's something about the place that is really extraordinary. And and I think on the new on the cover of the new book, it's really. It, there's something I don't know whether the picture is from Oxford necessarily, it is. but. It is, yeah. and that's, you know, having spent like four or five winters there, I mean, it doesn't snow very often, but when it does, it's magical. It really does feel like you'll turn the corner, open a door, and there's Narnia in wintertime, oh, right? That's wonderful. Yeah. I love that. I love yeah. that. Yeah. So amazing. it's it's just a lifelong fascination. Um, and, I, I, you know, I might, I had part of uh, the gown, one of the points of view was set in the modern period. One of the characters, Heather, uh, it was set in 2016. And I love doing contemporary uh, parts, mm. but I feel as if I just keep getting sucked back into the, the <laughs> That's past. That's a good Wait, do you think you'll ever write about Oxford? Do you think you'll write about that? Yes. Uh, you know, and I, yeah. I mean, there's parts, uh, one of my previous books has, uh, parts of it are set in Oxford. Uh, after the war is over, uh, there's, there's passages near the beginning and kind of flashback passages when the hair But like a act. whole. Yeah, I mean, I, not I, a whole thing. I but I do. I really. I think there's. You know, and maybe you'll just. Uh, you know, I'll. I'll be inspired to to write something that's fully <laughs> set there. You Who should. knows? Who knows? I, I mean, it's just such a magical experience. setting that. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I you mean, describe it, yeah. I think I've told you and and Mary Kay that the story of how this is like. So this is probably 25 years ago. And I was working in one of the reading rooms of the Bodleian Library. And mm. I was working on a very early clunky Mac laptop and typing away diligently. And I heard some strange noises outside in the quadrangle below. And I, I went over to and looked down at the quadrangle. And, you know, bear in mind that you, you know, after you spend, a, we all know this, you've spent a long time working on your writing or researching. You can feel a little kind of disconnected from the world, right? I went over to the window and I looked down and everyone in the quadrangle was was wearing 18th century clothes and wigs. Oh, and I was lovely. like, 
But I had a moment for a second thinking, uh, have I have I gone back? Has there been Did some I kind of thing? time Did slip I thing? Slip and, time? and then I looked back, and my laptop was still there. So I thought, okay, I'm not going to panic. Too, I I don't think that's really happened. And only when I went back to kind of looking out the window did I see the film apparatus. And it was actually they were filming oh. the madness of King George. There. Oh, wow. uh, but uh, but I, for a moment, I really did think because Oxford's the kind of place where you feel it. The past is so is, is so present. It's over. Uh, it's all tangled up together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Jennifer, and you know, we were talking about um, light bulb moments. Maybe that was a light bulb moment for time travel. Uh, you know, maybe. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, I, and I think, because I, I would have moments I'd be sitting at my my tutor, uh, his, I was at one of the newer colleges uh, called St. Anthony's, uh, but uh, he was at Merton College, which mm. arguably is the oldest of the colleges, although they, they fight yeah. over it a little bit over which one, you know, was, was founded, early, you know, the, at the earliest date in the 1100s or whatever. But, you know, and just walking through Merton, for example, and looking around and thinking of buildings that were built before, um, thousand, you know, yeah, I, I just a th like oh, a thousand years ago would so be inspiring. Very, yeah, very inspiring. Yeah, humbling too. I have to say. Oh yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, kind of continuing on that uh, that train of thought about time periods, and, and you know, Mary Alice asked about writing about World War II. Yeah. Um, Ari Ariel, can you hear us? Are you are you with us yes. enough to hear us now? Oh yay! Yeah. 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 Perfect. Well, so I have a question for both of you, because both of these books that you have both written are about World War II, and I write about World War II also. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to hear what you both think about why World War II mm -hmm. seems to be resonating so powerfully right now. I mean, I just feel like World War II, and you've both written about other time periods as well, mm -hmm. but it does feel like World War II is kind of having a moment. Mm -hmm. um, do you agree? And if so, why? It, Ariel, do you want to start? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you. Hopefully everything works this time. I think this is apropos for 2021. Yes. Um, a glitchy year already. Uh, I think personally that World War II is one of those evergreen topics because there was such a clear identifiable enemy. We all know who the enemy was. Oh, yeah. And everyone had to come together to fight them. It was a time when your butcher, your baker, your candlestick maker, your average person had to become a hero. Ordinary people had yeah. to step out of their comfort zones and they had to fight this common enemy. And there's something really unifying and really grounding about that idea. So when you set a story within a time frame, when everyone knows who the enemy is and your common average person becomes a hero, it's this... Mm it has this groundswell behind it. And I think people keep returning to that in part also because we know who won and there's a yeah. sense of comfort that right. I can read this story. Wow. And yeah. even if things are hard for this character in the end, I know everything is going to be okay yeah. because we have the scope of history behind us. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. That gave me chill bumps. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. beautiful and, answer. Mm -hmm. And and it's it's interesting to read a story where you know the end of the bigger story, mm -hmm. but you don't know the end of the yeah. smaller story that plays a, yeah, a yeah. role in it. Yeah, right, that's yeah. that's so true. Um, Je Jennifer, what about you? I think I absolutely agree with Ariel. Like that that is, I think, probably the the most um, uh, kind of that's that's in terms of the big picture. I think that's what draws a lot of us, especially right now, right? I mean, yeah. I think it, I find it kind of strangely comforting to read stories set in World War II. Yeah. Um, even, especially ones that focus on the home front because, uh, you know, all those, those uh, you know, the limitations people had, uh, the, the, the shortages they had to deal with, the rationing, all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, whenever I go back and I think about that, it, yeah. it, and then I set it against the limitations we, we've all yes. um, had, to, had to face up to over the last yes. year and a bit. It actually, you know, it, it makes it a lot easier, I think, to handle, oh, I, yeah. I can't do this small thing or I can't do that small thing when I think of yeah. people who year after year after year had to mm -hmm. cope with privations that uh, in, in, a, in a big, big way, but also even in places that weren't necessarily on, on the, the front lines, like even, yeah. even in North America. For example, people were having to to make do and mend, um, yeah. and be very careful with with uh, 
you know, uh, what, what they purchased, how they, how they uh, fed themselves. And yeah. that contrast between, and so, you know, I will say that my children are completely, completely sick of hearing me lecture <laughs> them about how <laughs> things were in World War II. And maybe we should not, you know, complain necessarily about things. Not that they've, I should add, they haven't been very complaining, but no. um, whenever, you know, I'm getting some eye rolling over, no, we can't order in food again. Uh, yeah. We could make it ourselves. Uh, then I'm just so tempted to say, well, in the second world war, you know, people <laughs> like, any you know, wheat. People yeah. didn't even get eggs. Like, you know, you, and, and, and sugar was rationed and so on. So that's, that's one thing. Yeah. I also think we're coming up against uh, what I think is really hard for a lot of us uh, to, to contemplate uh, is that, that we're really looking at the last generation of people who lived through World War yes. II are yeah. with us. And mm -hmm. we've already seen the passing of the great generation that mm. lived through the First World War. Um, and, you know, I'm old, I'm 51. I'm old enough to, when I was uh, in my late teens, I worked as a museum guide uh, at the, actually, uh, it, uh, really it was a, a, a guide at the memorial uh, at Vimy Ridge in France. And I got to meet matter, veterans of the First World War when I was there. That was 1989. Wow. They were there were still quite a lot of them, just coming off bu busloads yeah. of them uh, yeah. at that time. I mean, very elderly, but they were you know the pretty hale and hearty for for their age. And they're all gone. They're all gone yeah. now. Yeah. And when I contemplate another 20 years of, and, and then we won't have any uh, any witnesses, direct witnesses to what happened. Yeah. That is really sobering. That's something that yeah, makes me I, want to ask as many questions as I can um, yeah. and learn as much as I can while while we still have people who are alive to to directly recall those times. Ariel, you know, I was so taken with Nancy Wake's not just bravery, but her outrageous um, leadership. Could you talk a little bit about Nancy? We kind of skipped over that, and I don't want to do that because she's mm -hmm. such an amazing character. Oh, yeah. Thank you. She was so much fun. I've written a number of novels now, but Nancy was fun. And one of the funnest things as I researched her was bringing the personality that already existed to the page. This was a woman whose husband in the early days of their marriage taught her to drink and to curse like a sailor, <laughs> specifically so that the men of France would not be able to take advantage of her. And she did not know this, but going into battle many years later when she was a military leader, those skills helped her keep control of the 7,000 French resistance soldiers that she was in charge of. They would argue with her and she could berate them better than their mothers. They would try <laughs> to take advantage of her in negotiations for weapons. They would try to outdrink her, and she was always the last man standing. And she, she wore red lipstick into battle. She was the lone woman in a forest filled with 7,000 Frenchmen. And this was a woman who led those soldiers into battle against the Germans on the eve of the war. And you don't run across those type of women very often in life. And I remember in the early days of writing this story, as I was researching Nancy, she'd kind of left her way into a reporting job for Hearst newspapers. And one of her first assignments was to go interview the newly appointed chancellor, Adolf Hitler. That was one of her first assignments. But you fast forward 10 years later, and she kills a Nazi with her bare hands. So how does a woman, a young woman, go from being a green journalist to a seasoned warrior. And it was that, that transition that I was really fascinated with. How does this woman become that woman? And it, for me, at the heart of the story, that's what it was. How do you take a young Australian expat and turn her into one of the most decorated women of World War II? Wow. Yeah, you have me wanting to read her autobiography. <laughs> Which I know oh, you yeah. studied. Uh, you have great yes. footnotes, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So you all know that as part of our mission, when the far five of us started Friends in Fiction almost exactly a year ago, 
a big part of our mission was to support independent bookstores. Tonight, we're spotlighting Parnassus Books in Nashville. I know that is Ariel's hometown bookstore. So if you'll use the code FRIENDSFICTION10, you can receive 10% off on featured titles, including new and recent books by Ariel and Jennifer, as well as those of all five of us. Now, Ariel, I know Parnassus is located in Nashville where you live. Can you tell us a little bit about what makes that store so special to you? Oh, I mean, it's close. It's the only independent bookstore that we have. And of course, it's owned and operated by Ann Patchett, who is amazing. But it's also co-owned and operated, I should say, by a woman named Karen Hayes. And she was in sales for Random House, I believe, for a long time. And they worked the store together. And I know mm -hmm. everyone knows about Anne and has read her books and yeah. she's wonderful. Mm -hmm. But if you ever get the chance to go in, visit with Karen as well, because she is a book maven and she's wonderful. And she's the exact kind of person you want in your local bookstore. She's passionate mm -hmm. about books and authors and the art of book selling and the art of running mm -hmm. an independent bookstore. And together they make this really phenomenal powerhouse. That's so cool. And you know, every time I come, the first thing we do is go there together. But <laughs> so we talk about research a lot, you and I, when we're, when we're yes. talking about our books and how to research and about the balancing act. And I know you had to retrace because I went through it with you. <laughs> Nancy <laughs> Wake's journey <laughs> from yes. Paris to London, back to Marcel and then to the forest of our, a name I can't say, Ardennes. Ardenis, Ard the Aubyrne. Thank you. So I've seen your wall and anybody yes. who follows um, Ariel on Instagram has seen her wall in her office behind her is she pastes pages of her manuscript to the wall. Mm -hmm. um, so do you research that way? Do you research in chunks? Like do all the research and then write or you do you integrate them together at the same time? All of the above. I usually start with the research and I read as much as I can about my character, the time frame, the setting, usually until my brain is so full I can't hold another ah. fact. And then I begin to write. And from that point on, if I need something, once I begin the writing process, I will put it in brackets in the manuscript, find out such and such, the French word for pantaloons or whatever it is I need. And then I'll come back to it the next day when I sit down and write. So. But my wall, you can't see it right there. It's pages of the manuscript that I'm working on that I'm trying to make better. It's pictures. It's bits of research. Right now, it looks sort of um, very much Russell Crowe circa A Beautiful Mind. It's <laughs> a mess. There's red string connecting this idea to that idea and pictures and character mm -hmm. profiles. Sometimes I just have to see it. And when, you, when I get to the point of my novels and I'm deep in it, if I sit at my desk and I look directly at its physical representation, it helps me when I open the I word document, that. when I begin to write. Wow. I love that because we're always talking about how to integrate the research without falling down the research mm -hmm. rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. Jennifer, yeah. I know you go through the same thing. So we all do, all six, seven mm -hmm. of us. Yeah. And so then you, you, you always have, got Ariel this great way of knowing when to stop the research and when to start writing and when to dive back in. And so mm -hmm. I wanted to know how you did it up front or behind or. Oh, my, uh, my theory on suffering as you write. Yes, that's where I'm <laughs> yes. getting at. You have to pay so, up front. Tell, tell us your yes. theory. Most writers know that you're either a pantser or you're a plotter. It's what we call it. You either write by the seat of your pants, which means you sit down at the computer and you go and you have so much fun and everything is a discovery. Or like me, you research up front and you plot up front and you know where everything is going and you build the story meticulously on the front end. That is what I do. I enjoy that. It works for me. And I think you're one or the other. There's no point mm -hmm. fighting it. You you do one or the other naturally. But what most people never tell you is you're going to suffer either way. My <laughs> friends that are pantsers do most of their suffering at the tail end of a project. They do it in the edits and the revisions when they figure out, oh, I have 57 threads and none of them are connected. Yep. The Jennifer, are you, are you a pantser or a plotter? Oh, uh, like Ariel, a, a, a plotter down down to like my yeah. fingertips. It just I think the the history nerd quite often 
it, like it dictates that I have to know that I have to have the scaffolding uh, in place uh, of the history in order to build my story on it. Um, and so I tend to, like, I do the whole, you know, the layered, layered research, just digging, digging, digging. Um, and there's, a, I typically reach a, a kind of a tipping point where, uh, like Ariel said, my brain feels so full that I can't really absorb any more. And, and then I just have to, and also there's also that, those handy deadlines that, that your editors yeah. uh, will occasionally uh, send an email saying, so how's it going? And, and that's usually the point where I think, oh God, I, I uh, when does this do again? Oh Lord. And, uh, and then I'll, then I'll plunge into the writing, but I always have these moments where I have to stop uh, or I try not to stop, but I make notes for myself. Oh, there's, a, and it's more the detaily things that I pick up at that stage. Um, but one thing, and I, I, I'm sure we all have experienced this where I, I think I plotted it out and I think I know what my characters are supposed to do. And there's a certain point at which it doesn't happen in every book and, and it, and the degree to which it occurs varies, but sometimes the characters start to take over. And I've had <laughs> you know, scenes where I thought that uh, somebody was going to be dead at the end of the scene. And then they're <laughs> defiantly still alive at the end of the scene. And, yeah, and I'm, yeah. I'm sitting there going, I'm not, I thought I was in control here. So how is it that this character is not doing what I want them to do? It, it, it feels, it's almost an out of body kind of feeling. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I've learned to listen to them. It's taken me a while, but I've learned to listen. That's my favorite you know, part about writing. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I'm a total pantser. So that moment happens for me too. the whole time and I pay on the back end. Yeah. Yeah. We know that our lively and involved viewers have a ton of questions for the two of you. Mary Alice, can you ask um, one of the questions our, our, our viewers yes. asking? Okay, I'm gonna ask a crazy one. Dallas Gardner at Mitchell asks Jennifer, can mm. you please share the color name of your nail polish? <laughs> oh, <laughs> this color. You know what, I don't, I don't know what it is. I had it I, I, as a treat, it was my little girl's birthday of last uh. week. And, and we were, very, we were mm. able to, to go and get our nails done. Uh, very carefully, we're, Toronto is still under kind of a modified lockdown, uh, but but you can you can uh, we actually were happened to be out of town, and so we very I, I, we were definitely obeying all the rules, but we had these done, and uh, um, and I don't know what it's called. It was a, it was one of the OPI. Is it OPI? Well, OPI I have to say, yeah. I agree with her. I'm very jealous. I haven't had a mani pedi forever. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. It was like we were in a full kind of college. gear, um, and the only thing that was poking through the little shield were, were our hands. Um, and so uh, yeah, the first, and it was quite shocking the state that my my hand, you know, my hands were in. I have to say, thank you. Um, I have a really fun one. I love this. Um, so. Erin Rowe wants to know, have you ever had a light bulb moment to write a story while researching? And while researching, you have another light bulb oh, event yeah. for a different oh, yeah. book. Mm. Okay, so the question yeah. is, do you stop one and start the other or mm. do you keep going? Uh, I have a good story for you on that. Oh, good. Yeah. So my, not, codename Helene, but the novel before that is called I Was Anastasia. And it's the novel I never meant to write. I was deep in the process <laughs> of beginning a book about Alcatraz. And it was a Friday afternoon. I had all my research material. I had most of the book plotted out. I had not started writing. And I was on the internet looking for something. I don't even remember what it was to do with my Alcatraz novel. And I randomly came, like I just fell down a rabbit hole and I came across this detail about this woman floating in a canal in Berlin two years after the Romanov family was murdered and how this woman went on to become the most famous imposter of Anastasia Romanov or so she was called. And again, all the little hair sit up on the back of my neck. So I emailed my literary agent and I said, this just happened, this idea is great but I need you to tell me to get back to work on the thing we all agreed that I was going to write next. So just tell me to stop it and I'll refocus on the other thing. And she responded right away and she said, um, I think we need to talk to your editor. And that began this long conversation back and forth between Alcatraz or Anastasia. 
And wow. I actually did shift gears midstream and I went with Anastasia and it was the right choice. It's the only time it's ever happened, but it does happen sometimes. Wow. That's the battle of the A's. Yes. Alcatraz, yes. Anastasia. <laughs> yes. Jennifer, what about you? Yeah, it, it happened actually with Our Darkest Night. Uh, and I, I alluded to it earlier. I was working on, I spent months working on this other book that, uh, and I may, I don't know, I may still write it. Uh, and it took characters uh, from kind of the, the uh, one of my previous books, uh, a secondary characters from Good Night from London. And I sent one of them to Golden Age Hollywood. And uh, and to be honest, I can't really remember much more than that at this stage, which probably <laughs> tells you just how likely I am to write that book about Golden Age Hollywood. And it, it just wasn't coming together. It wasn't it sticking really. And as soon as I, I I had this other aha moment that was prompted by my son's question, it just sent me off like a rocket. And um, the, my my hesitation at the beginning, though, was I've never written anything. I'd never written anything set in Italy. Uh, mm -hmm. I I didn't have really any level of specialist knowledge about Italy in World War II, so I had to do a, a really uh, fairly fast paced, um, just a, a, a deep dive into the background history, um, which you know, it, it, it there again, it was it was intense, but. Um, but I was able to start work fairly quickly. And and there was really, as, again, as, as soon as I called my agent and told her about this idea, I think agents and editors too, will they have, you know, their antenna will come up. They can hear something in our voices when we found the idea that is setting us mm -hmm. on fire and they yeah, respond. They can to hear it. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, we have so much we want to ask you, but you know what? A funny thing is so many of our viewers want writer's tips. So ladies. Mm -hmm. I, I I have one that I think I almost alluded to a minute ago and then I pulled myself back, which is when I'm on a roll writing and like, you know, again, so many of us, like, you're pushed and pulled in every direction. And, and yeah. um, especially when you're at home and everybody's in, in the same house as you and, and, how to focus right and and if you're on a roll you have to respect the role and don't let yourself be pulled out of it and the and i don't know who told me this and but this is years ago and i i do it all the time if there's something i don't know as i'm writing and it's either say it's an adjective that i can't think of or it's it's a detail or a date or just it's just something that can be filled in later i i write i put t and K next to each other, TK, which, oh, you know, yeah. is, a, is a copywriter's term, but it has the great advantage of not appearing anywhere else. It, the two letters T and K don't appear anywhere else oh, okay. in conventional okay. English next to each other. So if you write down, if you type in TK, it's very easy to find later on and That's you keep right. going. And so then later, once, once, you know, one of the kids has come in and interrupted you or, or, you know, the phone rings or whatever happens and you've lost your stream of, of, you know, being in the moment, you can come back later and fill in the TKs, but, but that, that, that role you're on, you haven't interrupted. And that's, I, I feel honestly, sometimes that's the only way I can get books done on yeah. deadline is just to, to let myself go. And then pick up the little bits later. And sometimes you'll realize you didn't need that little bit like that, whatever that detail was, you're, you would have otherwise spent 15 minutes, an hour a day chasing down. You don't actually need that detail. Right. How about you, Era? You have a quick tip for us? Yes. Uh, my best writing advice is the advice I tell myself every single day, which is finish the book. There is no finished book without the finished book. There is no book deal without the finished book. There is no career. There is no really fun time on Friends and Fiction without the finished book. And it is the first and most vital stage. And you never finish every time. Every time I start over, finish the book, Ariel. That's your job. Yeah, I like that. I'm going to put that in calligraphy <laughs> i think our agents yeah, exactly. are going to edit are going to send us an email all tomorrow morning with that piece of advice yes. <laughs> finish the book finish the book you cannot go wrong when you finish the book i love exactly. it exactly so i know the five of us and you too ariel and 
Jennifer have groaning to be read shelves on our nightstands, but what are you both reading and recommending right now? Hmm. I am recommending this lovely book, An Unexpected Peril by Deanna Rayburn. It is book six in the series. And the series is called the Veronica Speedwell series. It's set in Victorian England and she is a detective, a lady detective way of reading. And book six just came out and I'm taking it one chapter at a time. Her covers are so good. I'm always a bit so envious good. of her cover. Yeah, they always have that really nostalgic feel to them. How about you, Jennifer? Um, so it it's not out quite yet. It's coming out in April and it's a debut uh, work of historical fiction by Kristen Beck uh, called Courage, My Love. And yeah, I keep hearing oh, about this. It is beautiful. So that that cover, you know, there's a, an amazing um, uh, um, photograph from, I think, the 1940s uh, called Walk to Paradise Garden by W. Eugene Smith. And he, it's his two little children. Uh, it just walking together and it kind of through underneath some trees. And for whatever reason, this cover really reminds me of, of that photograph. I, I just think it's, it's beautifully done. And so it's, it's, it's set in Rome. Uh, there's, it's two very different uh, uh, Italian women. Um, just their, their characters are so beautifully drawn and they're, they're both drawn, they're pulled into the resistance. Um, but I have to say when I read it, I, and I know Kristen, but I thought, well, maybe maybe she's Italian in background. Maybe her family's Italian, or she she, um, you know, there's some connection because the Italian women in particular were so convincing and so real to me. And I belong to an Italian family. I'm I'm like fully mangia cake, as they would call me. But I I've <laughs> been part of an Italian family for more than 20 years now, and the women I just thought were so. I just, I could see them, I could hear them. And, but she's not, she, she just is a really good writer. <laughs> so, so hats off to Kristen. I mean, for a debut book, I, I just thought it was, was spectacular. Good to know. That's awesome. It sounds good. And I, I'll always root for a Kristen. That sounds yes, good to me. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> she's so egocentric. Well. <laughs> oh, when are we having Kristen Hanna on again? We Kristen's are just the best. Me. I know. I know. Look, you kicked off the other Kristy. You like? I bet you put I'm her off the only show. Kristen. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Just a couple announcements before we ask one more question for Ariel and Jen. First, we want to say a big, huge congratulations to Lisa, Brenda, and the friends and fiction official book club for hitting 5,000 members today, which is such a huge milestone. Yay. We're so excited. I'm so, so congratulations, congratulations everybody. And they're, yes. they're going to be doing an awesome giveaway over on the official book club page. So if you're not already a member, head on over there and join. Yeah. Um, they have lots of fun books coming up, which I can say because there are books. I believe mm -hmm. <laughs> they're the friends and fiction author <laughs> books. But um, no, it's, it's, it's a great group. I also have to remind you that if you want one of those gorgeous jute uh, friends and fiction totes it comes free with your friends and fiction first mm -hmm. box from oxford exchange in tampa which is still available um you can find the link on our facebook page or you can also get that same tote bag when you submit your pre-order form from any store at all for all five of our books so that includes if you've bought it in ebook form if you've bought it in audiobook form if you've bought all five books in any form you can submit a form and get that um get that tote so that is also available uh through our facebook page um, and there's even a video that Christy made that explains how that works. Very easy. I mean, it's always fun to watch one of Christy's videos. <laughs> uh, okay, next week, I'm the very lucky host of an author we know you're going to love, Nancy Juyun Kim. And her book, The Last Story of Mina Lee, was a Reese Witherspoon pick and an instant New York Times bestseller. And it tells the tale of an unconventional mother-daughter relationship. And we love those. So that's this coming Wednesday at 7 p.m. And we hope you all are tuning in to our new podcast. It's not just the show anymore. We are now featuring original interviews with authors and book influencers. This week, we posted podcasts with my interview with Robin Crawl and Carol Fitzgerald. And Mary Kay Andrews and Kristen chatted with thriller writer Tana French. 
and she is from Ireland. And so we posted that today in honor of Ireland. And you can listen to the Friends in Fiction podcast in all the usual places. And just a quick reminder to support Mama Geraldine's Historically Good Cheese Straws and a woman-owned company, as well as Page One Books. There are two partners. And as we mentioned at the top of the show, they are partnering together a little bit. So, you know, our worlds are colliding, which is great. But you can use the code FAB5 on both sites. It gets you 20% off at Mama Geraldine's and 10% off your first subscription at Page One Books. Both links are on our Facebook page. Okay, ladies, Jennifer and Ariel, in both your books, you acknowledge what seems like a pretty powerful and amazing circle of writer pals. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the five of us on Friends of Fiction have relied mm -hmm. on each other and, and you, Ariel, for support during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So I want you to talk a little bit about how your writer friends have lifted you up during this time. Do you have meetups, rituals? Jennifer, you wanna yeah. go first? I have a I have a text thread. Uh, I have actually multiple text threads with my group of writer friends. Um, yeah, we unofficially call ourselves the Coven, <laughs> which <laughs> so people have looked at us like, oh, really? Um, and we're we're all based in the kind of uh, the Toronto area. And, and you know, there are women in the group. Uh, Karma Brown, whose amazing book Recipe for a Perfect Wife was oh, yeah. a big hit last year. She's part of the group, and Marissa Stapley, and 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 just it, it's you know what it's. I've just found having people who understand the weirdness that goes on in my head as a writer is wonderful. I, and I, you know, I mean, friends in general have been really what's kept me uh, going this year, um, being us. able to reach out to people. But, you know, in those times when you can't actually meet people and, and go for a coffee or, 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 or have dinner together, um, you know, we started yes. doing a lot of Zoom things, but now it's really, it's a lot, it's phone calls and, and yeah. text threads. The text threads though, I wake up every morning and there's, Karma's one of these people who writes at 5 a.m. Uh, starting every day. I, I haven't quite been able to embrace that. And so there's always a few texts from Karma that, that help get me going. And I, <laughs> I feel very grateful, yeah. I don't know how we would do without that, whether it's me, mm -hmm. how about you, Ariel? Same. There are several text threads. You're on one of them. You're on mm -hmm. you and another writer friend of ours. We, from the beginning of the pandemic, have texted and just encouraged and sent ideas or, oh my gosh, Articles. I'm so stuck on this plot. Yeah. yeah like yeah. I want to burn the book down. I want to use the book as cat litter. Like I'm going to kill the book. <laughs> and then your friends say, no, don't do it. And then we actually have an, a semi-regular Zoom meeting. We'll all pour a glass of wine and we'll sit down and we'll talk about how many words we wrote that week or what we're struggling mm -hmm. on in our particular book. And I, Zoom is hard because you're not in the same room. You can't hug your friends, but it's better than nothing. And to see mm -hmm. those faces every once in a while has been really helpful. So I think we're all doing what we were doing before, it's just forced us yeah. to use our technology more. We are all yeah. mm -hmm. clinging to our writer friends and trying to keep mm -hmm. our communities intact and yeah. remembering that we're not alone, even though we have been alone. Yeah. Or in my yeah. Yeah. in a house with four teenage boys. Yeah. Oh my God, you <laughs> are child. I thought, I thought just having one teenage boy was, was enough to break me, but four, wow, that's, you, you deserve <laughs> all the gold stars. Yeah, not to resort back to the- uh, I like her dad a lot. That's the only reason I'm still saying <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, that's awesome. You know, last week we were all about the ship puns, but really, <laughs> I think we all are clinging to each other. We yeah. are each other's life raft. Yeah. 100%. Um, I can't believe mm -hmm. it's that time already. I know we all have a ton of questions we wanted to ask you to. Uh, we went over- and I'm speaking for all of us. And I know for all of our viewers out there, we can't thank you enough for being with us. And to everybody watching, thank you for joining us. We love being with you on Wednesday nights. Don't forget, meet us back here next Wednesday night uh, when Mary Alice is hosting Nancy Ju Young Kim. In the meantime, join us on Facebook, on Instagram, and on our podcast. That's all, folks. Thank you, Ariel and Jennifer. Thank you, Ariel and Jennifer. Thank you. Ariel, you got through. Those leprechauns let you yes. through. Yay. Thank you. I'm so glad. I'm so glad it finally worked in the end. <laughs> yeah. I am too. Good night.
Thank you for tuning in. Join us every week on Facebook or YouTube, where our live show airs every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And please, subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here. Good night. Those stupid leprechauns. Oh, <laughs> I didn't get to see your promo. Ah, I'm gonna have to you didn't see the cover? Oh, he can oh, share there it is. again. He <laughs> put it back on. Oh, Isn't it beautiful? It's so pretty. I, oh, fooey. I was so looking so forward. Pretty. It's beautiful. Um, so ha I do have to say, halfway through, Sean, I know you can hear us. Um, Sean, Sean wrote in the chat, I get it. Peach, PCH. <laughs> How do you get it? It took him a year. <laughs> yeah, I'm smart. Look. You want to hear? He's, I'm smart. You know, we. <laughs> Tom and I were at lunch in the on the Tybee. There's only one really island hangout place for lunch, as far as we're concerned. It's Sunday Cafe. So we were there, and an old friend came by the table. And said, do you know how old I was when I figured this out? And we're like, okay, what, Ron? He said, I was 78 years old when I figured out that I'm mad, damn it, is the same backwards as forwards. I'm mad. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I, never, I never figured it out. <laughs> I was 66 years old when I found out. <laughs> I'm mad, That's damn it. Huh. That's That's that was fun. They are crazy. so interesting. I mean, yeah, yeah, they I are so interesting. I hate so the area I had problems, but at least we got to hear yeah. from her. I yeah, know. I had so crazy. many more questions I would have liked to have asked. You know, um, when um, Jen was talking about the age of the oldest, the greatest generation, how old they are, these World War II vets, um, Tom and I, a few years ago, there's a great World War II museum in New Orleans that Tom Hanks actually helped fund. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And um, the day we were there, uh, and I guess a lot of days, maybe before COVID, they have um, World War II vets sitting at tables with their scrapbooks. Um, and, awesome. anybody, any, and, and usually with their caregiver, they're in wheelchairs or on walkers, but they're sitting at tables. They have their scrapbooks from the war. And people could sit down and ask them questions. That's you know, amazing. And this is something, Kristen, you really should do. I took a riverboat cruise from Viking from Paris to Normandy, which we did too. Awesome. Oh, you've done that too? That's cool. Yeah. And when we were in Normandy, we actually saw the Normandy beach and wow. the that were bombed. And then we had a special ceremony for the, a, a number of, of uh, World War II vets who had taken the cruise just to go. Wow. They were so moved to tears wow. by being there. And the gratitude of the people, yeah. in Norway, it was so, to this day, still wow. found that yeah. I was so moved. I had no idea. Kristen, yeah. you've got to take that cruise. It's just, yeah. oh, Paris to Giverny. When cruises are safe again. Yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. We you were there funny. on 4th of July, actually. And oh, so they wow. had- Wow, how patriotic, yeah. wow. A lot of yeah. the houses that we passed were flying American flags. Oh, wow. that's so cool. That's, that's awesome. So cool. Yeah. The, the summer I lived in Paris, I was uh, like 22 or 23. And um, there was this young man that I was dating at the time, who a, a, a French, young French man. And he offered to bring me on basically on that trip just to drive up there because his right. family came from that area mm -hmm. and his his uh, grandfathers had fought in the war. And it, it had been this tradition of gratitude passed down, the gratitude wow. to the Americans yeah. and the British and, you know, realizing that we were kind of all in this together. Yeah. Um, and that's one of my greatest regrets from that summer is that I said no to it. I was... Um, I was being so cautious and I was like, I don't really know him that well yet. And I don't know if I want to get in a car with someone in a country that I don't know. You know what I mean? Like it was like all the reasons not to, but it, they, he and I are still friends and it, it's, it's a still a great regret that I it didn't It wasn't know. the right time. You were listening to your yeah. thing. So maybe. Yeah. When yeah. I was 22, I was working night shift at the hospital and you were in Paris. So <laughs> there you go. When I was 22, I was working as a reporter for the Savannah Morning News, I was working teased. 2 to 11, the 2 to 11 shift. Yeah. And a big night out was going to Shoney's. 
Yeah, so but you know, one of the things that was so beautiful in Normandy, they have the Norm the museum of the war, and then they have a little booth where you can go in, mm -hmm. and they have the face and the voice of individual servicemen. Wow, that's cool. Of what they experienced. That's mm. really cool. For hey, I but you know, before we sign off tonight, and I know we probably have to. That hey, hey, kudos to anyone out there who's still sticking with us. <laughs> I just wanted to say, Patty, how proud we are of you. We didn't yeah. we didn't have time to get to it in the episode tonight, but it's just survived um, Savannah. Yeah, you the your book had a wonderful Thank first you. week, and we um we all love you so deeply, and we're we're so proud of the success you've had with this we book, are. and. It's just been Thank wonderful, you. and and I and I know this next one's going to be even huger. I mean, I, I got this. I just got those goosebumps, and we're we're just so happy to be Team Patty, Team Patty forever. <laughs> Thank you. I'm happy to be Team you guys. I, this you guys made this week beyond. I know I made that video for you guys and for friends and fiction, but if y'all didn't see it, I am beyond grateful. So. Oh, All right, oh, dinner yeah. time. Team Patty, did you see? <laughs> Sean, you are cracking me up tonight, Sean. <laughs> I think we're having Mama G's for dinner. Tom, listen to this. Tom went to a St. Patrick's Day party with our friend Susan. They had a date, and they left me home. <laughs> <laughs> How wrong? How wrong is that? You Tom Trochak. Good <laughs> lord. I'm gonna have to have a little oh. chat with him. Okay, All right, guys. You're back. Love you guys. Um, Happy St. Patrick's Day. Good night. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night.